Well, this evening, uh, as I have already mentioned, you've already heard more than once, uh, we are beginning a new series. Um, and again, it, it kind of helps to group things together in a series rather than just dealing with random things uh, from week to week. It helps us get a sense that we're actually building and, and we're growing in, in our understanding of particular things. And what we're going to be looking at, uh, at least for, uh, for quite some time, I think, because there's plenty of, plenty of things that the Bible teaches that are not only foundational to Christianity, but also things that, that we as a denomination hold as uh, particular things. And again, things we may have in common with many believers, but areas in which we differ. And we did see this morning that, um, you know, as Jesus was speaking to the Sadducees, he did point out that there were things in which they were mistaken. And uh, the one thing in particular was marriage after the resurrection. You know, marriage doesn't go on. Marriage um, ends with, with death. And in the resurrection, we are like angels who neither marry nor are given in marriage, in that they were mistaken. But you can hold that belief, although mistakenly, it is an error, and still be a Christian. But there are other errors that are much more serious, and there was one in which Jesus said they were greatly mistaken. And that is in the fact they did not believe in life after death, they did not believe in the resurrection, they did not believe in spirits and so forth, although apparently they did believe in God. We must believe in the resurrection, that's one of the things that we have to believe in. So the point is there are some things we cannot afford to reject or be in error in, otherwise we're not going to be believers, we're not going to be saved, but then there are many other things that we may be in error in that will hurt us in some way, but they will not disqualify us from the kingdom of heaven. We're going to be looking at things from both categories, and we're going to begin this evening at a good starting point, I think, and that is with the existence of God. Why do we believe that God exists? Uh, as over against, in this case, atheists and agnostics. Let's begin by reading a portion of the book of Romans where Paul tells us quite plainly uh, the evidence that God has given to us that he exists, that all men have, and that leaves everyone, absolutely everyone, without excuse. Romans chapter 1, and we'll read, uh, I forget exactly the text that I gave, uh, but I think, uh, let's, read, let's just read verses 18 through 21. This is what Paul writes to the church at Rome. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. We'll go ahead and stop there, but what, what follows from that is a continual downward spiral, what it is that God does to those who reject the knowledge of God. He gives them over to their sins. If they will not have him as God, then he will give them over to worship the creature rather than the creator. If they worship the creature rather than the creator, God gives them over to degrading passions, things that in his sight are abominable. But again, in the sight of our nation have become not only acceptable, but reaching the point where they're pushing those ideas upon us. That's what happens to a nation that rejects God. He gives us over to our sins. So it is important that we do not reject what we see of God in, in the creation, that we do not reject the God that we know from Scripture, but that we worship Him and honor Him as God. Now, as I've mentioned, we're beginning a series that is asking questions, why? Why do we believe this as over against that? In this case, we're looking this morning, or excuse me, this evening, at why we believe God exists. And this is going to entail this series both, again, the defense of Christianity, what we would call apologetics, as well as polemics, or those in-house discussions that we have with other believers, why it is that we believe what 
we believe is over against other denominations that accept other, uh, other truths or believe the Bible teaches other things. Now, the reason we're doing this, again, follows from what we've seen this morning. It's important that we believe the truth. It's important that we have a very uh, a sound faith, that we believe in you know, what is real, and don't accept the lie that Satan has propagated in our society, in our culture, and, and spreading throughout the world, the lie that we just came about by chance, by accident, that we're just the product of uh, this evolutionary process it really has no rhyme or reason. We're spiraling upward, becoming greater and greater all the time. We really need to be grounded in the truth. And the truth is, God is the one who created us. Now again, as we understand this more, as we gain a stronger conviction of these truths, it's going to strengthen our faith. And the stronger our faith is, the more we're going to give ourselves to those things that we believe are true. And of course, the more certain we are of what the Bible teaches, the more certainty we're going to have that we are going the right direction because everything that the Bible teaches is going to point us in a particular direction. And again, if we are in error, we're going to go the wrong way. That's why we need to know what the truth is. So this evening, we're starting at the starting point, and that is why we believe that God exists as over against, again, atheism and agnosticism. But I'll tell you what, this is a huge subject, and we're not going to be able to deal with all the arguments for God's existence this evening, although by the time we're done, you may think that I've attempted to do that. I'm not, not going to do that. But we are going to, after we're done with the study on the Holy Spirit on Wednesdays, when we have the discipleship class, we're going to delve into apologetics and some of the different ways that by which we can see clearly that God exists. Well, as I said, there's a variety of ways that we can argue for his existence. Jonathan Edwards had an interesting one, which we're not going to look at this evening, that's called the argument, you might say, from the fact that there must be something that necessarily exists, something that cannot not exist. And again, as, as we think about that which must be, uh, Edwards has a way, and we'll look at this on Wednesdays perhaps, he has a way of, of understanding and deducing from the fact that there must be something that always has been. And again, I could fill out what this is, but when you fill it all out, you end up with a being that is, that is not just like the being in the Bible who calls himself God, but can only be this God. So one way we could argue that again is from the idea that there must be something that, has, that necessarily exists because it's impossible that nothing could be. And again, that idea is simply this, that uh, nothing, again, is not empty space. Empty space is something, but nothing, as Edward says, is what the sleeping rocks dream of. That's nothing. It's impossible that there could be nothing. Something must be, and that thing which must be is God. Now, we can also argue that God must be from the fact that um, rationality exists, the ability to think, the fact that there is order and logic and reason built in, the fact that there's principles and laws that are active within this what we call creation or what atheists would simply call a cosmic accident. Those things should not exist. They cannot exist if these things came about uh, just randomly or accidentally. You could not have thought. You could not have rationality. You could not have reason coming from these things. We could also argue that God must exist because, and this is what we would call the presuppositional argument, we have to presuppose that God exists in order to make sense out of anything that we see. And I would have to agree that that certainly is true, although sometimes that may not be very convincing to unbelievers because they think that they can explain everything without God. But the fact is, when you look at what there is in the creation, again, rationality being one of those things, it cannot be apart from a being who is rational. And we would say that everything that exists can only exist if God, in fact, exists. You know, we can even argue from the Bible that God exists. As a matter of fact, it's a legitimate argument. If I, if I want to prove to somebody God exists, all I have to do is open up the Bible and say, the word of God says that God exists. God himself has told us that. 
Now, again, they may not find that to be a very convincing argument, but I'll tell you what, it is a valid argument because the Bible is the Word of God, and they should believe it. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to necessarily go about proving the fact that God exists. If you were to open up the Word of God and read it to somebody as, as evidence, that would be enough for God to hold them accountable for believing because, again, God is speaking through his word, and they must listen. They may choose not to listen, and many people won't, but that doesn't mean that this is not a valid argument. It is a valid argument. But tonight, we're going to look at another argument that perhaps is a simpler argument, although not simpler than the one I just gave you, but let's say fairly simple with regard to the evidence, and perhaps one that people could see more directly and it would be sort of more obvious. And that is the argument that many apologists have used over the centuries to demonstrate the existence of God, and that is the argument from causality, or cause and effect. The idea that for every effect that we see, there has to be a cause behind it, and one that is, that is sufficient, or one that is great enough to explain what it is that we see. In other words, we have to have an explanation that actually can explain what it is that we're looking at. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at that argument and we're going to consider briefly at the end why use apologetics in the first place if God already tells us in his word that everybody has enough evidence to leave them without excuse. So why bother? We're going to take a look at that as well. So first of all, let's consider the argument of cause and effect. For every effect everything that is basically caused by something else, there has to be a reasonable cause, a sufficient cause, there has to be an explanation for why it has come about. Uh, basically, the argument goes like this, that if you ask the question, why, enough times, why, why are we here? You know, what, what caused us to be here and so forth? If you, if you ask that question about anything, eventually you get back to the first cause eventually you get back to God. Now, again, if you were to ask an evolutionist, uh, if they were to ask the question why, they think that they've, they've found the answer in something which is an insufficient cause, something that isn't uh, enough to explain. Now, we just want to use a, a couple of examples here as far as uh, using you know, their argument versus ours. Let's say you're, um, you're, you're walking along and you see a laptop you know, somebody left their, lap, their laptop on the grass or something in their park. And you ask yourself the question, well, let's see, how did that laptop get there? Now, would you assume that that laptop simply spontaneously generated out of the ground because there was enough time and material and energy, the sun was bombarding the ground and, and through this uh, random collision of energy and matter over a sufficient period of time, this laptop just sprung out of the ground. I mean, is, would, you, would you think that? Well, that answer obviously would not explain the laptop, and I think you understand because it is not a sufficient reason for that laptop because it doesn't explain many things about it. If you were walking along and you found a copy of the works of William Shakespeare, I use that because it's sufficiently complicated, but any book, I mean, even uh, let's say a Dr. Seuss book, uh, would you, when you saw that book, think, it must have been a tornado somewhere in a, in a print shop that uh, formed all of these sonnets and formed all of these plays and put them together in a nice hardback bound book and laid it on the ground right there. You know, is, that, is that what you would think? I mean, you would never think something like that happened because it doesn't explain the book. It's not enough of a reason why that actually exists. The problem is the laptop and the book both show signs of intelligence. They show signs or evidence of a mind that's behind them, of design and of purpose. Things that the ground and the sun and time don't possess, or a tornado as it rips through a print shop, if it print shops, like let's say in this case, it would, would actually have to uh, manipulate the keys on a computer <laughs> these days because I don't think we use you know, the, the print, the set print anymore. But 
these are things that, that, that random collisions and accidents, as it were, cannot produce. Why is, then, everything as it is? Because what we look at, when we look at the creation, when we look at life, when we look even at the cosmos, what we see is order. We see design. We ask the question, why? Why is there an ordered universe? Why is it filled with galaxies and suns and planets and so forth? Why does this world exist full of the life that is in it and, of course, all the systems that keep that life going? And why is life so full of information? Information on how to build life, how to repair life, how to maintain life, as well as how to produce new life. Well, I would submit to you there's really only two, uh, well, two things that could possibly uh, answer that question. Actually, only one of them could, but only two things that people have suggested as reasons why the cosmos exists and why life exists and why everything is as it is. And the two uh, competing uh, reasons are chance or design. Now, you know that evolutionists champion chance. They believe in pre-existing material, pre-existing stuff, stuff that became unstable at some point in time and exploded. And as it exploded outward, it virtually created everything that we see over a long period of time, this well-ordered universe. Now, I'd submit to you that that belief is essentially the same belief as believing that laptops can spring out of the ground or that books can be printed, as it were, by a tornado running through a print shop or a, a bookshop or places that, that make those things. That given enough time with matter, energy, and time, you can explain anything. Anything can happen. That's basically what evolutionists believe. Now, I'm not intending on arguing necessarily against that because the idea is so absurd, and I'm hoping that just the, you know, just considering that something far more complex, I wouldn't want to use the word infinite, but we might be tempted to do that, something so much more complicated as a human being can spring out of the ground given enough time, that is far more absurd than the idea that a laptop could spring out of the ground, and all of us would reject that idea, I hope, out of hand that such a thing is possible. But I do want you to see that there are things about life that argue even more strongly against that possibility. Now, is it possible that all things happened by accident? Well, no, it's impossible. And basically on two grounds, and the easy way to prove it, of course, is just simply turn to the Bible. On biblical grounds, Paul tells us that God created all things. And he's made it apparent to everyone there is evidence in creation, enough evidence to prove that God exists, the God of the Bible. So much evidence that Paul tells us that those who reject it are justly punished. They are justly judged by God for their rejection of that truth. They have no excuse. And as we see in Scripture, God judges them very severely. His wrath is being poured out every day against ungodliness and wickedness. And one of the ways in which it's done is by God giving them over to their sins. Do you wonder why our nation is spiraling down in its morals and why things are getting progressively worse and worse? It's because they're rejecting the knowledge of God. God is giving us over. They see it, but Paul says they try to cover over it. They try to suppress it because of their sinfulness. It's there but they are blinding themselves to it because of their sinfulness. So according to the Bible, everybody already knows that God exists and will be judged for their rejection of him and their refusal to acknowledge and worship him as God. So this, again, is one of the reasons why we believe that all things did not happen accidentally. God's already given to us an argument that can't really be overcome by anyone, and God will not accept any arguments against it. But secondly, the evidence itself is overwhelming. 
Paul here is speaking about evidence. Well, what is that evidence? So the evidence is that of design, of intelligence, of power and of wisdom on a cosmic scale all the way down to a microscopic scale. The creation speaks of infinite wisdom, the wisdom behind the making of all the things that God has, putting them all together in systems that work and sustaining them from day to day. And of course, also, when you consider the vastness of the creation, the infinite power that is necessary, because only infinite power could create and arrange and sustain not only this world, but the galaxies we see, as well as what's going on in the human cell, and even within the atom. And some scientists believe that it goes even deeper than that, that even the so the, uh, the, the particles, I guess you would call them subatomic particles that atoms are made of, the electrons, protons, and neutrons, and even those things are just simply smaller particles that are also orbiting quickly. And who knows, if you break it all down, just how far it goes. Again, everything speaks of design. Now, what I'd like to do is just consider one argument that demonstrates design, design that eliminates the possibility that matter and energy and time could have actually produced what we see now. Now, as I've said, we could pick any system that God has created and probably on any scale to make this argument, to see his power, to see his wisdom and to see his glory. The whole creation speaks of it. Again, one of the uh, biology teachers I, I uh, had said that um, in, in the past it used to be the cure for atheism was simply to go outside your house and look around. Immediately it would be cured. But now because of the arguments that evolutionists put out, people walk outside and they look around and they say, where is God? Arguments can be very powerful. Sinful hearts will embrace them. But again, everything that God has created speaks volumes of the fact that he exists. If you just go outside and look around with your eyes open at what you see and you ask that question, why are things as they are? How did these things come about? Then you will see what Paul is talking about. Now, since the Lord has really blessed us with more in the present day than just simply the ability to go outside and look at the trees. I mean, I'm, as I'm talking, I'm looking at, you know, the trees with the leaves blowing in the wind and so forth. I mean, might take a little while to, to come, if you ask those questions, getting all the way back to God, but there are things that we have discovered over the years that scientists have discovered that make the arguments so powerful and so clear. And I wanted to give you what I thought was perhaps one of the clearest and most powerful arguments, and that is simply the argument of information. Information is what is necessary for life to exist. Information is something that we are loaded with. We have it encoded on our DNA, and every living creature has that information built into them, at least the information to build what it is that particular thing happens to be. The DNA contains the blueprints to build life. Now, the DNA molecule contains the, all the information that is necessary to build everything that is in your body to build all of those systems and to make them work properly if that information isn't too terribly corrupted. I mean, it's able to build the brain and the nervous system that basically controls everything that's going on within the body. It's, it has the information to build your lungs and your circulatory system to be able to take uh, food, as it were, or fuel and oxygen and so forth into the cell and and uh, bring those things in there as well as to take the things out, the waste products, and carry them away. It, it has the blueprints to build your digestive system that is able to digest food to get that fuel for your cells to run on. It, it has the blueprints to your skeletal system, which is basically the structure on which all of these systems are going to hang and be supported. It has the blueprints for your muscular system that gives you the ability to move around. The blueprints also for your sensory system that give you the ability to gather information through your eyes and your ears, through smell, taste, and touch so that you can learn about the world around you. If we didn't have senses, we wouldn't know anything about it. 
the DNA contains all the information that is necessary to build and maintain all of these systems that are going on in your body down to what's going on in the very cells that all of your organs are made of. And really, everything that's necessary to keep those things alive and active. Now, I remember when I was in college, just the idea that, I don't know if you've seen any of the Wilder Smith videos, I think some of the, um, I forget whether they're Moody videos, they might be. But the idea of this information, there is so much information on the DNA molecule, enough to fill, I believe he said, five, it was, well, be the same way either way, but let's say a thousand volumes of 500 pages each of complex chemical reactions necessary to build a human being. All of that information is encoded on every single DNA molecule in your body, and there are trillions of cells in your body. So the question is, where did that information come from? Well, I would submit to you that, and we're going to see this just a little bit as well, a little bit more, that matter, energy, and time cannot explain where that information comes from. Now, secondly, not only is the information there, but at the same time, there is a mechanism present as well that is able to take that information and put it to use. Uh, there's, interestingly enough, inside of our cells, there is what's called the RNA molecule that is able, in itself, this is, you know, again, odd, but it's a, it's a molecule which should be, by all rights, dead and, and not moving, but it's able to move, and it's able to go into the nucleus, and it's able to unzip the DNA molecule, and it's able to read the information that's on the DNA molecule. It's able to take that information, rezip the DNA, go out and gather other molecules, and put them together, and then stick them in the place where they need to go in order for that cell to function and be healthy and normal. So all of that is necessary, all of that is there, all of the molecules that the digestive system and the circulatory system bring are the molecules that the RNA needs in order to build the things that it needs to build so that the cell can work. So not only is there all this information, but there's a mechanism that is also present that is able to put that information to use to produce and maintain life. I don't know what you think about that, but to me that's an amazing thing. But now there was one more thing that Ken Ham added last time, well, at least last time that, that, um, that he was there and, and we had the chance to go listen to him. And that was the idea of context. There's a context that exists for this information. There is not only the information, there is not only a mechanism that, that has the potential to put that information to use, but there's also a context in which that information can be understood. Let me, let me give that to you by way of example. Suppose that you had a book that contained information. And let's just suppose again for, for argument's sake that that book is again the works of William Shakespeare which uh, would take a long time to understand anyway because it, it is written in some kind of English but not very clear English if you've, if you've read any. <laughs> some people like it, some people don't. But now let's say you have the book, so you have the source of information, and over here you have a reader, somebody who has the ability to read and could potentially make use of the information if they can understand it. But let's say the book is written in English and the reader can only understand German. So you give him the book and he reads it, is he going to be able to do anything with that book? Well, not as long as he doesn't understand the information. So again, the point is you could have the information, you could have the mechanism that could potentially you know, make use of that information, but it has to be able to understand it. There has to be the, the context, as it were, that is created in which the information makes sense so it can be put to use. So you have information, you have a mechanism that can put that information to use, but you also have the understanding of the language of that information, so the mechanism can put it to use. Now, the fact that all three of them are present at the same time, the information, the machinery, and the context or the ability to understand the information, all argue design. 
Now, any one of the three could do it because you can't explain how any one of those three exists in an evolutionary worldview. None of them can be explained by matter, time, and, and energy, by random chance. But how much more when you find all three of these things together at the same time making life possible? Again, this argues design. And design argues designer. And a design that is this intricate and elaborate argues tremendous intelligence, wisdom, and power. And if we include in that the fact that the universe also, um, well, displays design and symmetry. I, I was having a conversation this, this afternoon at lunch. I think it might have been with uh, Joshua Daniel. But um, I remember when Dr. Hartnett came here, who is, I think is like PhD in astrophysics and he works for uh, Creation Ministries International. Uh, he was telling us how as they, as they photograph and, and examine you know, the, 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 uh, the gala, or I should say the universe in this direction and that direction, that direction and down, and they, they built this 3D model of the universe from what they've been able to gather. And as they look at the universe and all the galaxies and so forth that are in it, they built this model that shows basically that the universe is symmetrical, that the universe is um, not only that, but it, 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 from what they can gather, the Earth is, I think you said, just, just about at the very center of, of this whole symmetry. It just, in other words, the, uh, the point he was trying to make was the fact that the, the universe shows design. I think we understand that, of course. But science shows that this, uh, that this design that the designer has created is also created on a cosmic scale. And what kind of power, what kind of intelligence, what kind of wisdom is necessary to build a system that is that large? Now, if we can't deduce from the fact that we have this information, this mechanism, and this context for life to exist, that the cause behind it is an infinite wisdom, intelligence, and empower, we certainly have to conclude that when we consider the universe as a whole. Now again, that's just one argument. We, we need to remember there are other things too that exist within man that would require an explanation beyond what even the things that we're aware of can explain, such as why is man able to reason why is he able to learn? Why is he able to love and hate? Why is he able to make moral choices? Why does he have purpose in life? Even the organization we've been talking about and the life that exists, the information, the mechanism, and so forth, doesn't explain those particular qualities or characteristics about a man. They can't be explained by the physical matter itself that makes up the brain or the body. There is something else in man, something that the Bible describes as, as immaterial, as a soul. And how do we account for that? You know, if we don't, you know, if we don't uh, posit, as it were, the fact that a designer exists who has the ability to do this. So the question we're asking is simply this. Did random matter and undirected, uncontrolled energy and long periods of time cause all this to happen. You know, we're considerably more complicated, as I said before, than a laptop or a book. And yet we would readily admit that a laptop isn't going to spontaneously generate out of the ground. And neither is a book. It's impossible that these things could come into existence by accident, regardless of how much time you have, because of the law of cause and effect. For every effect, which in this case is man, is life, there has to be an antecedent cause that explains how that came about. It has to be sufficient. It has to be great enough to explain. Now, scientists seem to believe that given enough time, anything can happen. But I would also argue that that isn't true. And what we understand of the creation actually proves that it isn't true. The more time you have, the less likely it is that something like this is going to happen because of the what's called the second law of thermodynamics, which basically states that everything, everything that is, is tending toward 
increasing entropy or randomness. In other words, the longer that something exists, the more it's going to decay, the more it's going to fall apart rather than put itself together. The longer any motion continues, the slower that thing is going to go. The more that any heat source exists, the cooler it's going to get. The longer that anything that is organized uh, exists, the more disorganized it's going to get. So basically what I'm saying is you can't argue an upward climb on the basis of more time in the universe or within man on the basis of this law. You can only argue a downward spiral, which is in fact what we see, what we see going on. Things are becoming increasingly random. Even that information that's coded in your DNA is becoming increasingly corrupt. And that's one of the reasons, of course, why it's important that your DNA not match uh, your spouse's DNA. And that's the reason why the Lord has forbidden that we intermarry too close of a relationship is because the matching DNA will cause more expression of this corruption in the language. But that fact that you, know, you may have some corruption that I don't have and so forth or that the husband and wife have different areas that are corrupt is the reason why we can still have healthy children. But the fact is things are spiraling downward. They're not moving upward, which is what we would expect to see if, uh, as time goes on, if in fact God made this world, and if what his Bible says is true, that the creation has been infected with sin, which brings, of course, that increasing randomness, because as our Lord says, you know, from the dust we were made, and to the dust we will return. And so the law of cause and effect and the second law of thermodynamics proves that organized, or I should say unorganized matter, just, just stuff, with uncontrolled energy and limitless time, that is evolution, can't be true. Rather, it proves creation. It proves a designer. It proves an infinitely intelligent and powerful designer created not only the universe, but everything that we see. One thing I also want to mention is that if you were to get more deeply into apologetics, you can not only deduce the fact that God exists, even from what we've just seen, but you can also deduce something of what he is like. Uh, because, you know, we've already seen some things about this creator who made us. We've seen that he is infinitely wise, he is infinitely intelligent, he has infinite power. Okay? But because the cause has to be sufficient for the effect, everything that is true of the effect must also be true of the cause. In other words, you won't, I mean, well, if, if we have certain abilities, that cause must have those abilities as well. If we are intelligent, he must be intelligent. If we're able to see, he must be able to see. If, if we can think or be aware of our own existence, he must be able to do that. Remember one time, uh, again, talking about even greater simplicity. I was uh, working as a custodian during the summer uh, when they would bring in these um, temporary custodians to fill particular positions. Oftentimes they would put me to work with them because uh, I was the low man on the totem pole, so I was the one who got to work with them. But when I did, I would be able to talk with them. You know, when you're alone in a room working, there's a lot of things you can say. Well, there was this one gal who was a Buddhist, I think, uh, or she believed in just the idea, well, again, of evolution. We just sprung out of the ground. And I said, don't you believe uh, in the law of cause and effect? You know, for every effect, there has to be a cause that's sufficient for that effect. And she said, yes, I believe that. And I said, well, you believe we sprang out of the ground. Do you believe the ground is able to think? Do you believe the ground can see? Is the ground able to reason? Is the ground able to do? And I would explain all the things that are true of us. And she was becoming increasingly uncomfortable because she realized that even though that was her excuse not to believe in an intelligent creator, she realized on her own principles that she couldn't believe that. And so she didn't want to talk about it anymore, which is usually what happens, because it brings them face to face with God. Whatever is true of us has to be true of what caused us. Otherwise, the law of cause and effect, I mean, if that isn't true, then anything could happen. You could have, as, as even some evolutionists believe, an alligator lay an egg and a chicken hatch out of it. 
And not only one chicken, but you'd have the same thing happen very close by, a female chicken and a male chicken suddenly spring out of alligator eggs that are able to procreate. They did believe that for a while because they realized that microevolution did not seem plausible, so they thought it had to come in big leaps. Well, again, if you don't believe in cause and effect, anything can happen, but the fact is, as we examine the creation around us, we see that that is the case. For every effect, there has to be a sufficient cause for it, and that proves the existence of the God of the Bible. Now, again, there's many other things that we can learn about God by studying his creation, but that's, I think, enough for now. Now, let's not forget that even without an organized argument, God has given us enough evidence, he's given enough evidence to everyone that leaves everyone absolutely without excuse. There is evidence that everyone can see Evidence, Paul says, that actually gets through. Evidence that leaves everyone without excuse that God exists. So everyone who denies the existence of God is actually lying, not only to themselves, but they also are lying to you when they tell you they do not believe in God. God exists. It's evidence, clear. Now let me just spend just a few minutes on this second point, and it's simply this, that if this is true, if it, if, if it is true that God has given to us an argument from creation that leaves everyone without excuse, why do we even need to bother to argue with apologetics? I mean, why, why do we have to try to prove to somebody God exists when, as a matter of fact, they already know that God exists? Well, on the one hand, you don't really have to. You don't have to prove it because, again, they already have enough evidence that God exists. All you really need to do is give them the gospel. I mean, the Lord has not really necessarily told you you need to prove his existence or prove that the Bible is his word. Before you use it, you can just simply use it, simply give them the gospel. And the Lord can convince them and the Lord can convert them. But on the other hand, we do need to realize that God does, in fact, often use arguments. Uh, he's the one who actually gave us the arguments in creation, which means that he obviously has a purpose for that evidence, and that obviously is to leave man without excuse. Now, unbelievers work overtime to try to build a wall of arguments against the knowledge of God so that they will not have to face God. I think we know that's true. I mean, we even do it in our sinfulness, if we want to do something, we'll come up with reasons why we can do it and it's okay. And then for Christians, of course, the Lord will later bring us to repentance. Well, the unbeliever does it and he does it all the time. As a matter of fact, um, the greatest intellects that God has ever gifted uh, unconverted man, uh, they will use that intellect to tear down the knowledge of God so that they can live with themselves. There was a brilliant man by the name, I think it was Bertram Russell, who wrote a book, Why I Am Not a Christian. He was using the reasoning power God had given to him and a superior reasoning intellect, although a sinful one, to try to prove God didn't exist. There's others today who do, have devoted their whole lives to doing this. I think Richard Dawkins is one who was, I believe, a professor in a university who decided to take up the gauntlet to try to destroy all religion so he could set people free from the tyranny of religion so they wouldn't be doing the things he thought were the cause of all the evil in the world. And he would include Christianity in that as well as anything else. He said, well, most of the battles that have been fought have been fought over religious principles. If we just get rid of religion, I think John Lennon had some kind of a similar view. If we just forget there's a heaven and a hell, just pretend it doesn't exist, and let's just live for today and everybody love one another. Religion is really at the center of all this. Well, you know, again, people have reasons, unbelievers have reasons why they want to try to tear down the knowledge of God. And so they build up all these walls of argumentation to try to cover over the knowledge of God. So why use apologetics? Well, apologetics has the ability to take the, the arguments that God has given to us in creation and to make them more powerful, to knock down those walls and to uncover what the unbeliever has covered 
and to bring a person face to face with God. Uh, we even see in scriptures that that is what sometimes the apostles would do when they were uh, preaching the gospel to a group of Greeks who didn't have that background in religion that the Jews had. Uh, for instance, Paul and Barnabas in Lystra, to buttress their arguments for the existence of God, pointed to God's providential care and pointed also to his ordering of history in Acts 14, 16 through 17. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Paul is pointing to natural revelation and God's kindness in, in nature uh, to show that God exists. He did not leave himself without witness. So the apostles used arguments. Uh, we can use arguments to make, as it were, that revelation of God, which the unbeliever has tried to cover over, to make it more evident, to make it more powerful, to make it more pointed, something like taking a blunt bar and sharpening it to a spear and, and then using it in that way. So there is a purpose for apologetics, even though God already has given us enough evidence to leave everyone without excuse. Now, in closing, let me just simply apply this in two ways. The first one is this. Not everybody here has necessarily made profession of faith, and there may be a variety of reasons for that, uh, or has you know, publicly owned Jesus Christ, or even confessed Christ to other people. In other words, some may be here this evening who, for one reason or another, maybe aren't fully convinced that God exists, and maybe you have some arguments that you've built up that you're using as an excuse not to believe in God. Well, if the Lord this evening may have broken perhaps that wall down or perhaps even uh, popped a hole in that wall, allowing some light to shine through, I would just encourage you not to try to plaster that hole up or to rebuild that wall. The Lord has a reason for this evidence, and he has a reason for even somebody standing here and giving you an argument for God's existence and that reason is actually a good one, to open your eyes to the truth so that you might see it and acknowledge it while there is still time to turn from your sinful unbelief and actually to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to save you from the judgment that will be yours if you don't turn from that sin. He has done this so that you might receive what it is the Lord actually offers freely to all men, which is that if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will save you and bring you to a world, which, as we saw, I think something of this morning as we consider what life was like after the resurrection, the new heavens and new earth, a world without pain, a world without death, a world without sin, and certainly a world without any suffering. The Lord has done this for a good reason, and, it, and it's a very gracious reason. And if he has done that for any of you this evening, then reach out to him in faith while you can still see, while your eyes are open, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will save you. Now, for the rest of us who are already convinced of the fact of God's existence, the things we've looked at this evening can also help us. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where Things going on in the world, you've been out of the means of grace, you haven't been worshiping, you haven't been reading, you haven't been praying, you haven't been fellowshipping as you should. Your sins are getting the better of you because of temptations. Perhaps you fall into particular sins. And even Christians can sometimes begin to doubt whether or not what the Bible says is true and whether or not God really exists. I mean, that can happen. It's, it's, as we look at the evidence, I mean, it seems inconceivable, but it happens, doesn't it? We know it happens because we have struggled through those very things ourselves. If that is the case with you, understand that these things we've looked at this evening can strengthen your faith. There have been times when I was struggling with certain things having to do with God's existence, and I would begin to re just review the evidence, you know, look at apologetics, and it would dispel the doubt because the enemy is always going to be coming in trying to bring that doubt, trying to 
bring that deception, bring that lie, try to deceive you into thinking these things aren't true, and he'll attack even true believers. But God has given this evidence not only to convince the unbeliever, but he's also given it to confirm us in the reality of his existence, as it were, almost like a, uh, oh, I'm not sure exactly what, what the term would be in nautical, uh, in nautical terms, but there's this idea of a star that you fix, you know, you fix your heading on and you, you stay that course, and as long as you can keep that star in your sight, you know you're going the right direction. So it's, it's the idea of, of that sometimes that we need to keep our eyes fixed, to keep us moving in the right direction, to remind us that God does, in fact, exist. And when we're able to encourage ourselves in that way, and I'm, I'm hoping actually that you know, the, the discussion of these things this evening has, has strengthened your faith. When that faith becomes stronger, it, it strengthens our conviction that what we believe is right, what we're doing is right. We're not just wasting our time. We're not just giving up the fun of the world and our opportunity to only go around once in life and grab for all the gusto. We're not giving that up for nothing. We're giving it up for something better, something that isn't sinful, something that isn't self-centered, something that isn't just a matter of, of pleasuring myself. We're, and that doesn't mean that Christians are masochists, that we, you know, we enjoy pain. We're giving up pleasure so that we can work, as it were, all the time, or giving up you know, what are called the passing pleasures of sin for something that doesn't exist. But we're actually giving those things up in order that we might inherit a much greater pleasure and one that lasts forever. As we understand the existence of God and as we understand the fact that the Bible is his word and our conviction of that grows, then also our conviction grows that this is not a waste of time, but this is the truth. What I'm doing is right. What I'm doing is good. And it's the only way I can go, and it helps you stay the course. It helps you keep moving in the right direction. It helps you keep moving forward. And it keeps reminding you that the things that you do for the Lord are not going to be in vain. But you will receive what God has promised for all your sacrifice and all of your work and labor for him. And that is a greater reward. So this evening, again, why do we believe that God exists? Well, cause and effect, second law of thermodynamics, all the information that God's placed in this world and the things, the, way that is, you know, the fact that they work the way they do, design on a cosmic scale, there's all kinds of reasons why. These are things that God has actually placed in the creation so that we would see and know that information gets through. We know, all men know, that God exists. And of course, he has revealed himself so that we might turn to him through his son and trust in his son and having trusted in his son that we might serve him and love him and honor him our entire lives that we might eventually someday live with him forever. So however you need to hear what the Lord has said to us this evening, may the Lord grant you the grace to hear and may he encourage your hearts to move in the right direction for his glory. Well, let's bow in just a few moments of, of prayer, silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply his word um, to us again as we need to hear it individually.